welcome to worship at College Hill Moravian Church. You've just heard the beautiful music of our music director, Gwen Michael, on the organ. Joining me in this space this morning as well are the Reverend Tammy Raker from Westside Moravian Church. Rich Harney is helping us out once again by recording the service today. And I'm Pastor Chris Johnson. Um, most of you probably know I'm the pastor here at College Hill. I'm glad to be with you today. I invite you to greet one another from the parking lot with a honk of the horn. This has now become my very favorite part of my Sunday. <laughs> I, I love that. So glad we are together today. Uh, let me share with you what's coming up in worship this morning so you can be prepared. Um, the first page you'll want to have ready will be page 139. It belongs to the Liturgy for National Occasions. And let me just say that seems like a strange thing to pray uh, at the end of September. It's not really attached to a national occasion per se, but I think our nation could use some prayers these days. So as we pray that, let's think of it as, as simply that, a prayer for our nation. And again, it's on page 139. Later on, you will want to queue up page 476. Um, that will be the special music slot. You get to be your own special music this morning. Hymn 476, His Name is Wonderful. And when we get to the conclusion this morning, the hymn will be 583. My Lord, you wore no royal crown. Um, we will be singing a tune that's more familiar than the one printed there, but the words are on page 583. With that, again, I welcome you to worship. Uh, I encourage you to settle in, settle your hearts, settle your minds, and prepare to honor God with your whole heart. Um, we may prepare while we listen to the prelude.
Lord, I lift up my soul. And my God, oh my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly trusting. Make me to know your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me, for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. Amen. <clears throat> At this time, please turn with me to our prayer for our nation. This begins on page 139. sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness.
because of your steadfast love that we are not consumed. You offer us mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against you and have not obeyed your command to walk in your laws, which you have set before us. Lord, have mercy on us and blot out our transgressions. We pray, Lord, that you will guide and bless all who are in places of authority, protect them from violence, fill the hearts of the people with respect and love for them, because you have established their authority. Raise up for us leaders who will carry out all your purpose, and in patience and courage will depend on you. Save your people and bless your heritage. Make this nation an instrument for the promotion of peace, freedom, and righteousness. May it be a haven for the oppressed of other lands, a home of happiness for all who dwell within its borders, and may our commitment to liberty and justice for all be preserved for the generations to come. Hear us, gracious Lord and God. Guide us and our leaders through the spirit of Christ's love as we struggle with matters of teaching and learning, home and family, health and security, work and justice. Turn the hearts of all people to you that they may seek eternal life through Jesus Christ, who redeems us and our world. Hear us, gracious Lord and God. Grant wisdom to those who are in the family of faith. Enable us to accept the authority of government for your sake, ready for every good work, abstaining from every form of evil, and paying to all whatever is due them. As citizens of this nation, may we bring credit to our Savior in all we do. Hear us, gracious Lord and God. Grant to the people of this and all other lands a love and peace and order, that the nations shall win war no more. Hasten the day when the kingdom of the world shall become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Hear us, gracious Lord and God. Amen. Jesus, we don't know. 
Neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. Our second reading is from uh, Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. If, then, there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing of the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being of full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore God has so highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Please turn in your books of worship to 476, and we will sing about that wonderful name of Jesus. We'll sing, His name is wonderful. Yesterday, I received an email from Miller Keystone, the blood donation hub in the Lehigh Valley. Because of multiple recent traumas, it said, the emergency blood supply is nearly exhausted. So extraordinarily, Miller Keystone opened this morning, Sunday morning, 6.30 a.m., and urged donors to come in to alleviate the critical situation. Um, they will remain open until 1.30 today in case you want to stop in after worship. Um, but they are also looking for donors to call and schedule weekday appointments. Um, and that would be ASAP. They're looking for all blood types and they are especially interested in your blood if you happen to be O negative or O positive. Um, if you are able, please step up. And especially if you've never done this before and you're at least 16 years old, this would be an excellent week to start. Donating blood always strikes me as a magnificent example of the concept 
It gets described in Philippians 2, and particularly that seventh verse, which speaks of Jesus' willingness to empty himself of himself in order to be entirely receptive to God's will. To empty oneself of a pint of blood seems like a slightly sl sacrificial devotional act in honor of Jesus who demonstrated complete selflessness. In the scheme of the lectionary readings throughout the church year, actually the three-year schedule of that, this Philippians passage uh, gets regularly matched up with Matthew's message in the 21st uh, chapter. And that's where he introduces a conversation about the concept of Jesus' authority. And to me, when you put those two together, the pairing emphasizes not just that Jesus has authority, but how Jesus uses his authority. The qualities of authority we see in Jesus and the influence he has wielded for a couple of thousand years look very different from what we observe coming from the most prominent elected leaders of our nation and the conversations that go on during the current and oh so protracted election season. I don't have to tell you that things are kind of ugly out there. But if you're tempted to look away because it is ugly, let me give you a reminder from the Moravian Covenant for Christian Living that we, as Christ followers and as citizens of this nation, because of those things, it is part of our faithful witness to be engaged in the process. I'm going to quote from the Covenant for Christian Living. Uh, it talks about our civic responsibility, and it says, Considering it a special privilege to live in a democratic society, we will faithfully fulfill the responsibilities of our citizenship, among which are intelligent and well-informed voting. It also includes a willingness to assume public office ourselves guiding the decisions of government by the expression of our opinions and supporting good government by our own personal efforts. We're reminded of uh, a higher loyalty. We're rem reminded of Acts 5.29. Though giving our loyalty to the state of which we are citizens, we do recognize a higher loyalty to God and conscience. And then, Something I don't ever want us to lose sight of, the, the, the final part of that section says, for the sake of the peace which we have with God, we earnestly desire to live peaceably with all people and to seek the peace of the places where we dwell. End quote, covenant for Christian living, our Moravian guidance. Now, that's really as deeply as I will wade into election politics in a sermon to encourage you to be well-informed, to encourage you to vote. This would probably be my November sermon, but I know that we need to, uh, if we're voting by mail or such things, we, we need to hear this sermon early this year. In 2020, being well-informed, I'll also say, means that... Uh, um, we need to be attentive to more than one news source. Um, we need to be aware that pretty much all reporting and all commentary has slant. We have to recognize that slant, and I think to balance the slant that sometimes we prefer, we should go out of our way to find a source that has a different slant and to try and understand both sides and find a middle ground. Um, I also think it's really important to practice articulating what is important to you um, in your own words. It's really easy these days to throw memes around and sound bites around, throw them back and forth because they're pithy and they're to the point. But I think it's important to take the time to assess for yourself why 
you resonate with that particular meme. Uh, what chords do they strike in you? Go deeper in identifying your values. And then be sure to measure your thoughts against what you know of Jesus' teachings. This is how we are well informed and engaged in the process. Now let me tell you, I lose sleep over how to talk about even these seemingly neutral sentences in our covenant. One recent evening, as I prayed earnestly to God that, that God would help me figure out what to say and how to say it, what I do is I usually pray while I'm falling asleep and then I often wake up in the middle of the night and a, and a thought bubble is sort of there over my head. And this time, the thought bubble, when I woke up, the one that materialized in my mind, said very clearly, Mrs. Nottestead, Mrs. Nottestead, Mrs. Nottestead. And I said, Mrs. Nottestead? If this was a word from God to bring me clarity, initially it was not at all helpful. Mrs. Nottestead was one of my sixth grade teachers. On the long list of teachers who have inspired me along the way, the, the kind of teachers that I've sometimes written a thank you note to, I have to say Mrs. Nottestead never really made the cut on that list. It's not that I ever thought of her as a bad teacher, it's just that I sort of never really thought of her much after sixth grade at all. So as Mrs. Nottestead is, is in the thought bubble over my head, I'm, I'm wondering to myself, what, what is this point that's surfacing here? What is this life lesson that I seem to have missed along the way? What I remember of my sixth grade classroom and my teacher was that it was all very orderly. Um, and, and, and all of my educational experience up to that point, all of my classrooms uh, had been very traditional in, in that you know desks were in rows and they were kept even and and there was a system, if the teacher wanted to hand something out, she'd hand the stack to the people in the front of the room and they'd all pass their papers back. And it was, it was just all um, very under control and, and predictable. But one day, I, I could tell Mrs. Nottestead must have gone to a conference or something, because one day we came into the, our sixth grade classroom and it was a whole new thing. Um, our desks were in clusters. Um, we were in groups. We were going to be able to collaborate, and this was a very different thing at the time. So I was in group number five, and there happened to be five girls in group number five. And this cluster of girls became kind of tightly bonded. Um, and it turns out we kind of turned our learning cluster into a bit of a club. And just for fun, and because this is the type of girls we were, we were a, a creative bunch with access to craft supplies and somehow access to a six foot tall, durable cardboard spindle that a hunk of carpeting had come on. Because we had access to these things, we made this adorable flagpole that we sort of uh, pinned in among our, our clustered desks and, and it rose above the classroom and it supported a construction paper sign where we designed well it was sort of our own logo it incorporated our group number five and then it worked in all the names of all the girls we hadn't been asked to do this it was not part of an assignment it was just the sort of thing we did after school to entertain ourselves so we installed this flagpole and we were allowed to display it for a few days. And then the weekend rolled around. And when we came back to school on Monday, the flag had been removed. And the clustered desks had been all placed back in well-defined forward-facing rows. Learning experiment over, apparently. But it wasn't just that. Mrs. Nottest had called her parents. She had them come in for conferences with her as if we had done something awful that was going to be on our permanent records. And I was mystified. I could not figure out what we had done wrong, what I had done wrong. At the parent-teacher conference, I was introduced to a new vocabulary word, click, C 
C-L-I-Q-U-E, defined as a small group of people with shared interests or other features in common who spend time together and do not readily allow others to join them. Huh. Anne was another girl in the group, and uh, I guess between she and I, we were perceived to be the ringleaders of this nefarious syndicate tagging our territory with gang signs and all. And to this day, I really think Mrs. Nottestead overreacted. But you know, there may have been a grain or two of truth in her explanation to my parents. She noted that Anne and I had leadership qualities. Leadership qualities. And she hoped we would hone these qualities as we grew up. We were, after all, only 11 years old at the time. But the way we were exercising this leadership, according to her, it was building animosity and discomfort in our classroom. The tight peer group we were knitting appeared to be exclusionary. And that was contributing to a hostile environment. Now it would be another 30 years before Tina Fey would bring the movie Mean Girls to life. Um, that was based, uh, that was an adaptation of the sociological study called Queen Bees and Wannabes. But I think Mrs. Nottestead was sort of ahead of her time in this, and that's exactly what she was trying to nip in the bud, this privileged status, this too much ego, bullying behavior. My leadership qualities needed to be channeled differently, channeled in a way that led to inclusion and belonging for everyone. I don't recall Mrs. Nottestead actually helping me develop those qualities in a positive way, and so maybe that's why she doesn't make my list of inspirational teachers. But as I think about it, maybe she was a lot more influential than I ever realized. A little ironic twist on the side, when I moved on to junior high, I became the victim of some psychological bullying from some actual mean girls, and it was just really too bad Mrs. Nottestead wasn't on watch in those days. It's too bad, too, that Mrs. Nottestead hasn't been on watch throughout these recent years uh, as the kind of the fabric of our society gets battered, kind of like the construction paper flag crumpled up and tossed in the classroom trash can. Case in point, I spoke with my dad this week. He lives in an enormous retirement community in which people, people uh, typically move around in golf carts. Um, that's their main source of transportation. And he told me the other day, he was out doing some errands, he was on foot. Uh, he was doing some errands around town and, and, um, and, and he described a, a large group of enthusiasts for uh, the presidential candidate he does not prefer. And doesn't matter which side. But in, those, um, in, in this golf cart parade, um, there were so many folks there um, it, it grew so large that it seemed to kind of embolden um, the folks in the golf carts, and it kind of turned into a, a rowdy gathering. And Dad said he began to kind of feel unsafe as some of the behavior turned really menacing. These people in golf carts were menacing pedestrians. Now, my dad is no shrinking violet. He is quite good at throwing hand gestures that I don't always approve of. Uh, I often tell him that God's probably not terribly proud of him when he does that. But that's not what he was doing this day. He felt bullied by a mob. This makes me slightly worried for him. He can take care of himself, so I'm not overly worried. But more than that, it makes me deeply sad. This is, however, not anything worse than what Jesus knew. Because the conversation about where his authority comes from, that passage out of Matthew, that was a political conversation. That was about entrapment. That was about figuring out where the power was situated and, and, and trying to come into alignment with it. And that conversation happened just days before Jesus was executed. And that happened just days before Jesus' life was, uh, was emptied out deliberately. 
And that happened as Jesus allowed it to happen, selflessly. And that is how Jesus exercised authority. Let's join in prayer. Holy One, we have already this day prayed for our nation, which is in a really tumultuous phase. And we pray that we are reminded always that you are our ultimate authority. And we, when we make decisions about how things are done in our communities and our nation and our world, we, we pray that we remember that you are who we elevate. And we take that into consideration. We take you into consideration with all of our decision making. So keep us people focused on you and on your mission and on your desires and on your deep, deep, deep love. And let us emulate that. We know that your deep love is available to all of us at all points. And we think and we hold in our hearts those who need special doses of it, those who are ill with chronic conditions and with new conditions and concerns. We pray for those who are grieving, who are sad by losses in their lives. We pray for those who are lonely. We pray for those who need inspiration just to move forward. We pray, Holy One, for those who are hungry for food and hungry for knowledge and hungry for spiritual growth. We pray for those who celebrate. And we pray that everyone who has a breath in them and a reason to celebrate remembers that, that you are present. Holy One, all of these prayers and every prayer of our heart we lift to you. We pray in gratitude for your greatness and your wonder, for your authority, most especially for your love. And we do pray always, always in your name. Amen. Some announcements before we leave this space today. Uh, next Sunday, we will be celebrating World Communion. Uh, so you will receive uh, communion elements as you come into the parking lot. Uh, so be ready for that. Two weeks from today, we will be acknowledging our congregation's anniversary. And we will be having a bring your own love feast. So please uh, be, be planned, be prepared uh, to have something to eat and drink with you on that day. And also in two weeks, as part of the celebration, I would encourage you to do what you can to decorate your cars, make some signs, um, Hold them out your your uh, the, the 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 top of your sunroof and wave them around, saying who you are and 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 something cheerful for your neighbors to see. But what what you can do to to spruce up your vehicle and, and make it a joyful occasion. Uh, I'll remind you that Miller Keystone is looking for blood donors. If you are a blood donor uh, and if you want to be a blood donor, please 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 get an appointment. And then uh, you, have, you are probably aware, and maybe you have plastic with you, but we are having a, uh, a plastics collection behind the church as you leave this morning. We trust that your plastic is sorted appropriately. If you don't know how to sort your plastic appropriately, Nina has some examples out, and, and if you don't think yours match the examples, you can resort your plastic before you turn it in. Uh, but I thank everyone who's engaged in that, uh, that project. We are a part of the BAM churches who are uh, collecting these for the good of the earth, uh, the good of creation, and also as, as an opportunity to have those plastics recycled into benches that then all of our Bethlehem churches will receive. And well, so that's what I encourage you to remember and be attentive to today. As we get ready to leave from this place, our closing hymn is 583, 
And again, we're, we're substituting the two, so don't let that throw you. But the words are 583, my Lord, you wore no royal crown. in peace. 